All right, well, good morning, everybody. Good morning. So glad you were all here today. My name is Donnie. I'm one of the pastors here at Aletheia, and glad to be with you as we spend time unpacking, on God, unpacking God's Word um, this morning. We have been in the book of 1 Peter, and um, I, we're going to continue in that book today. We've got a few more weeks as we study what Peter would say to us, the Apostle Peter would say to us. So I want to invite you to turn with me. We're going to begin, just dive right into Scripture, and I'll pray, and we'll get going. But this morning we're going to be in First uh, Peter chapter 2, and I believe um, we're, we're going to be looking at a difficult yet very timely passage for us. Um, and I don't mean that just for our church family, but I mean for the church writ large in the nation we find ourselves. Um, it's probably one that we don't want to hear, uh, but nevertheless, one that God and His providence is giving to us today. So again, we're going to be in First Peter chapter 2. If you don't have a Bible, uh, we'd love to give you one before you leave. And also, um, as we get going, the words will be on the screens uh, behind me. All right, it says this. Beloved, I urge you, excuse me, starting in verse 11. Uh, Beloved, I urge you as aliens and strangers to abstain from fleshly lusts which wage war against the soul. Keep your behavior, behavior excellent among the Gentiles, so that in the thing in which they slander you as evildoers, they may, because of your good deeds, as they observe them, glorify God in the day of his visitation. Be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people. Live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood. Fear God. Honor the emperor. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust. For this is a gracious thing when, mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if, when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if, when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. For to this you have been called, because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example, so that you might follow in his steps. He committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree, that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. Even this is the word of the Lord. Would you pray with me? God, would you uh, be pleased to meet with us today? Um, God, we're all coming from uh, just different uh, amounts of uh, hecticness in our weeks. We're coming, uh, we're walking into uh, different uh, challenges before us. Some of us are in transitions either to or from this city. Um, God, you're doing something in, in, in many of our lives, or in all of our lives, I should say, and of that, we are in desperate need of your grace. And so even as we study this passage today, would you help us to receive that which you would have for us? Holy Spirit, come, um, enlighten your word as we study it, um, that we may be forever changed as a result of interacting with, it, interacting with it yet again. It's in Christ's name I pray, amen. Um. For those of you who have been transformed by the gospel, for those of you who are Christians today, uh, to use some Christianese words, uh, for those of you who have received the grace of God, put your faith and trust and hope in Jesus as, the, uh, as the, uh, um, the, the hope for your salvation and have repented of your sins, turn your back to everything that God, would, uh, that God would say separates you from him. For those of you who are in that camp, Peter is writing to you, to us this morning. Um, He wrote to a time and a place in which people were scattered all around the the kind of the, the, or I should say scattering all around the known world at the time, and their faith was impacting so much of what they did. And yet, there was many questions, okay, how do I respond to my culture? How do I respond in these moments of suffering, of, of challenge, of persecution even? And, and just as a reminder, Peter writes to a time in which this is, predates the time of widespread, widespread government-sanctioned persecution of Christians. 
This is before things got really bad. And so he's writing to a people, and he, in verse 1, chapter 1, just to jog your memory, memory Pastor Adam unpacked this a few weeks ago, he, he calls them, and he calls us, elect exiles, those who have been brought by God's grace into his family, who have been transformed and brought into relationship with him. We have been chosen, and we have, we, he, he, has, he has purchased us by giving his very life, speaking of Jesus. And as a result, we have been chosen to have this relationship with God. God chose to do something about our condition. And that's a very cool thing for us. But yet, the, that's the election part, but then the, uh, coupled with that is the reality that we are exiles. This is not our home. Once we are spiritually awakened and we, we receive this grace of God and we have this newfound relationship with Him and we begin to realize that everything doesn't line up with the way that God intends, not just around us, but also to us in the way that we interact with the world, and this becomes very challenging for us. And so we come upon this moment, and Peter speaks to us, and he says, I urge you, and he reminds us as aliens and strangers in this world to act in some ways that we might glorify God and that others might believe that he is who he says he is and be transformed, that they too would glorify God in the day of his visitation. And he launches into a couple things couple of brief yet specific qualifications of what it means to keep our behavior, behavior excellent. And he starts, of all places, with how we are to respond to government authorities. Of all places, this is where he starts. And what he doesn't say is he doesn't say, hey, all you Christians, get in a group together, get in that holy huddle, trade goods, move to a co-op in New Hampshire, live in a yurt, you know, grow your own chickens, and they just have a blast. He doesn't say that. What he says to you, he's like, no, you are to submit to the governing authority. So what I would say this is, and so instead of that, he says, as recipients of God's grace, so we are to bravely honor authority. We've been talking over and over again about this book being about a grace that would make us brave. A grace that would help us become, not only become the people who, who God has called us to be internally, but how, help us act in ways that would honor and glorify Him. And Peter makes it clear under no, no uncertain terms that we are to act in certain ways when it responds to the human institutions around us. Verse 13, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance of foolish people, live as people who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God. Like I said, I find this super interesting. Uh, super interesting in, in, in the time that we find ourselves living, this, this campaign three years that we've been in, in our nation, it seems like, and... Um, and uh, this, I, I don't know about you, I realize I'm kind of pa a little past the bell curve in our church, but I, there's so many similarities that happen every four years in our nation. And one of those um, is the, the, the veiled threat uh, about moving to Canada. Everybody talks about moving to Canada when it comes to an election year. I mean, have you not heard this? Like, guess what? It happened back the first election I could vote in, which was Bush versus Gore. It happened back then, too. Everybody was apparently moving to Canada, and yet our population is still growing. I don't know how it's happening. Canada must be doing great. I guess. Maple syrup. Maybe people got stuck on the way. I don't know. Anyway, so <laughs> Canada. It's this veiled threat all the time. I'm going to move to Canada. And it's no different. Like, we were sitting in our staff meeting, like, like how are you going to respond to the government? Well, you know, there's actually, I love, okay, I'm kind of the end of the Gen Xer, kind of end of the millennial range. I love millennials because you guys are so creative. There's actually an app now where it I don't know if you've heard this, but so if your candidate loses, there's a dating app that helps connect you with people across the border so that you can get married and move that much faster to Canada. <laughs> it's amazing. It's amazing. So, gosh, you guys are awesome. Could have been rich. Didn't think of that. All right, so be subject to authorities. Nothing is new. It's hard to live under authority. I mean, we're American, right? Shoot, authority, I do what I want, when I want. You know, this is, I mean, this is the home of the Boston Tea Party. Like, you don't, authority, shoot, I'll just dress up and throw some tea in the ocean. Like, well, this is how I'm going to deal with this, and we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna, we're gonna go crazy up in here if you want to understand 
you want to make me submit to your authority. But God says something totally different. He says, be subject for the Lord's sake to every human institution, whether it be to the emperor as supreme or to the governors as sent by him to punish those who do evil and to praise those who do good. And so many of you act like my kids. Like, you're like, but I don't like him. She's terrible. I don't like them. This policy, oh, I can't, God hates this. Why would I ever submit myself to this? And a lot of times you act, and I'm serious, like my kids. So I have, I have two sons. My oldest is four. My oldest son is four, four and a half. And if you haven't seen my son, he's usually in the first service, sitting right there or standing right there during praise and worship. And if you took me and shrunk me down, took away some of the body fat, but added like more thickness somehow, he's like a hoss. And so he's, he's just, I mean, he weighs more than his sister who's a year and like 18 months older than him. And so, um, and so it's, really, it's really funny to watch my kids because, well, he's the oldest boy, and so his sisters pick on him, right? And so um, especially the one who's just older than him, who they're like best friends a lot, but they also fight a ton. And so, so we get others know my, my Lila. She's wiry. She's really spry. She's actually quite, she's got great hand-eye coordination. She can kind of throw a jab and get out of the way really quick. And so, um, but so inevitably throughout the week, at some point or another, my, son, my, my daughter will run in crying, fake crying to me and say, Simeon hit me again. And, and so this immediately starts a conversation between me and my son. Simeon, and some of you have heard similar conversations that I've played out for you before from the stage. Simeon, what's your last name? It's Fisher. Do Fisher boys ever hit girls? No. Why did you hit her? Because she did X, Y, or Z. And I was like, are you going to hit her again? No. You know, it's kind of like, <laughs> um, you don't ever hit girls. This is, and that's, 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 that's my family. That's our rule. Lila deserves it half the time. I'm not going to lie. I'm like, I'm kind of proud on the inside that you held up that long. Ten minutes ago, I would have, if I were you. But, so, it's kind of working here. We do the same thing all the time in our culture. With politics, politicians, um, the authorities that we find ourselves unto. But I don't like that. I don't like him. I don't like her. I don't like what they're saying. This is not the party that represents me. These people don't really know me. They have no idea. Can I just remind you of something? Christians, you are elect exiles. This is not your home. Don't be surprised when it doesn't look like it. Okay? You're elect exiles. Peter, if Peter can say this, then it's so much more applicable to us today. Do you know who was in power when Peter was writing this? Nero was in power. Again, the great persecution that Nero started hadn't quite started yet in Rome. Peter lived in Rome while Nero was in power. You know who else was still in power? Pontius Pilate, who had Jesus killed in front of Peter's eyes. He knows who he's writing to. He knows what's going on in culture. And he says, to them, which means it's still very applicable to us, submit to every human institution. You see, when we don't, and when we hang our response to the attitudes of those in government ahead of us or above us, we sound honestly as juvenile as my kids, but I don't like him. We just get mad and we just throw stuff out there. But when we remember that we are a chosen people and that we are representatives of God on this planet, we have some great opportunities that lie before us. When we act like that, when we act as his representatives, and when, as we discuss politics, as we look at policies, listen, I am, I am under no... Um, I am under, just, there is, the veils have been lifted I, from my eyes. I am under, just, I don't believe uh, that our, Christ, our, our nation is Christian, as you say. You can't, if you look, if you go down to the laws, to the core, we are not a, quote, Christian nation, though we have great Christian influences. However, we have great opportunities before us as we respond. We have great opportunities to vote and to see things change in our nation, nation. We absolutely should, and we should get involved, and we should disagree well and honorably for the glory of God. But Peter's word is still applicable to us. Notice one thing he's not talking about in here. He never once addresses civil disobedience. He never once. It's actually t very tempting as somebody who's talking about this to say, well, here are the exclusions from that. 
Here are the areas and the times in which you can disobey and not submit to the human institution. Peter very conspicuously avoids that altogether. Now, there are parts in Scripture that we can point to, absolutely, but I'm going to avoid it simply because Peter does. Paul, in some other places, some other epistles, writes, um, when is it appropriate? And I'll just suffice it to say that when a human institution violates the overriding law of God, that is when it is okay to civilly disobey. Done. Now let's move on. You can't disobey just because you don't like someone, or you don't like their party, or you don't, they don't know who you are or where you came from. We are to submit to the human institutions that we find ourselves in. It's a little hard. It's a little hard. I don't know. I, I don't know what, I have no idea what the percentage of Conservatives, the liberals in this room, Republicans, Democrats, Independents, um, people who live in Vermont, I don't know what we are in this room, but for all of us, there's a challenge to grow in love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, faithfulness, gentleness, and self-control in this regard. It's a challenge for us. But make no mistake, Peter does not tell us to wait to be coerced in this or made to do this. He says, Submit yourselves to the human institutions you find yourselves under. What does that mean for you? Um, well, let's go easy, right? Uh, when the alarm goes off when you're climbing in the T because your fare didn't go through, you stop and you turn around and pay it. Okay, submit yourself to the human institutions. Pick up after your dog, people. Pick up after your dog. In Cambridge, please pick up after your dog. That's kind of gross when you're on your phone and you're walking. Um, what are some other ones? Listen, use your blinker. Use your blinker. Submit to the human institutions. Yes, don't run stop signs, bikers. Don't run stop signs, bikers. Those laws are for you too. Come on, submit to human institutions. The idea here is for us to be exemplary citizens, that we would walk in this nation that we call home in such a way that the, 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 the reality that we are elect exiles would be so apparent, and yet people would be happy to see us come. Even those that disagree with us, even those that rule over us, if you will. I had the opportunity just uh, last week um, on uh, Thursday morning, there's a, there's a great church in, uh, in Cambridge called uh, P, uh, Pentecostal Tabernacle PT. Bishop Brian Green is over there, and he's done a great job of, of help bringing the pastors to, uh, of, of Cambridge to interact and serve our government authorities. And it was such a joy to pray with people um, and who, who work in our government offices right across the street last week to pray for them um, and to, to honestly bless them in some ways and just say, listen, we're here to serve. We love the city. You're serving the city. Whatever we can do to help. I'm not going to take that moment and say, there's no way I'm going to talk to him or her because I disagree on some policy. No, I'm going to honor them because God has told me to in his word first and foremost to honor them and the authority that they carry in my life and in this city. The same is true for all those who rule in us, rule over us. For Peter, the good and honorable work of the Christian community is nothing if it is, if it is not in submission to authority. Verse 15, For this is the will of God, that by doing good you should put to silence the ignorance, ignorance of foolish people. Do you understand... Um, I, I realize in a room this, this large, there are some of you who are, who are not yet Christians or who are kind of just kicking the tires of Christianity or maybe somebody brought you here the promise of lunch or brunch or whatever. And so, uh, but, but sometimes for us Christians, we forget that for those who are not Christians, every time another Christian leader fouls out or, or, or does something and it's, and it's publicly blasted all over news outlets or this guy did this immoral thing or this person stole money or this, this organization just, just, just wasted all their donations in the name of Christ, that it taints our reputation. And so, so to many who are not Christians, they, 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 they honestly don't see the transformative power of Christ because everything that they know is what's given to them from the bad news that comes across the channel. Forget the 97, 8, 9 point whatever percent. That would be awesome news if we could see it all played out. But we hear the news and it taints, or it taints our reputation as Christians. And so in that moment, when you disagree with their political party and you bash their elected official, how do you think that plays out for modeling Christ to them?
you see our goodness and the way that we honor those around us or those above us in authority will be our greatest apologetic to those who are far from God. Especially those who are politically and ideologically different from us. And I don't mean that we all have the same exact ideology. Please hear me correctly. I'm saying for each and one, every one of us individually, when we have those moments, the way that we respond reflects on God to those who do not yet know him. So you have a great responsibility. Peter's interesting because you've got to understand that this lesson didn't come overnight to him, this idea of submitting to authority. Again, he's writing to a, what we would consider a terrible regime, if you will. Um, I mean, Nero would literally, a few years down the road, begin lighting Christians on fire to light their sidewalks at night. There was hostility, and yet Peter's talking, there's growing hostility, and Peter's yet talking, he's saying, no, submit to authorities. But there was a time in which he didn't do this. Do you remember in the Garden of Gethsemane, when Jesus is, the, 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 uh, the soldiers are coming to arrest Jesus. So what does Peter do? He draws his sword and takes a swing at the guy, and we assume he misses and only gets his ear. And Jesus says, whoa, 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 you're missing it. This isn't the point, and heals the guy. This is the same Peter who's now saying, submit to authority. And basically what he's saying is, listen, I put that sword away. I put that one away. God has given a sword to the state, but we as the church are to keep ours sheathed in many ways. We are to keep ours sheathed. Now listen, I totally understand. Some of you are going to go off to do great things. Some of you are going to be fantastic politicians. You're going to serve in government. You're going to serve. You're going to get elected to office. Listen, I, I am so excited about that. We're not saying the church should disengage from culture or use, uh, use the, the opportunities afforded to us to honor God in those arenas. That's not what we're saying. But we are saying as people who live in a, in, 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 or within a nation that does not always submit to the Lord's authority, we are going to honor those who serve in that capacity as far as we are able to. And we are going to show them love and respect as God instructs us to in the Scripture. It goes on to say, live as people, verse 16, who are free, not using your freedom as a cover-up for evil, but living as servants of God, Honor everyone. Love the brotherhood, your fellow believers. Fear God. And he brings it back down. And honor the emperor. As recipients of God's grace, we are to bravely honor authority. That takes bravery. It takes bravery. The second thing that he brings out here in Scripture is this, and, 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 I'll, and, I'll, and I'll tell you what, what, I, what I've received out of this passage, and then we'll kind of unpack it, is this, that as, as recipients of God's grace, we are to bravely take responsibility and do good. As recipients of God's grace, we are also not only just to uh, honor authority, but we are to bravely take responsibility and do good. Verse 18, read this with me. Servants, be subject to your masters with all respect, not only to the good and gentle, but also to the unjust, for this is a gracious thing, when mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, you endure? But if when you do good and suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. Um, as a little side note here, for us in this room as, as Americans, it is nearly impossible for us to read this and not have the horrific uh, history of slavery that's happened within our nation come to mind. And, um, and as we read this, I totally understand for some of you, you could read this and think that this might actually seem like the New Testament is coming to accept or turning a blind eye to, to something that we, and I would argue rightfully, have come to wholeheartedly disdain. Um, let me be unequivocally clear about something. Uh, this passage has nothing to do with what we know as slavery in our history. Um, continuing my sidebar, the Bible actually does a great job of undermining slavery of doing a great job specifically in First Timothy and some other places of calling out those who would trade people as property, saying that's far from anything of godly, and that those who do it should repent and stop immediately. In other, words, in other places, it, it goes all throughout the New Testament, un undermining any kind of practice like this. Rather, this is looking at something that's kind of different. So we hear servants, we think slaves. That's not what you need to think when you read this. Um, so I just wanted to say that. 
you have any questions about that, we'd love to talk to you more about what the Bible's stance on that. But again, just trying to stay with what the Scripture actually says. He's writing to a, an actual servant class of society. It's one of the three classes of the Roman society found himself the lowest class. And to kind of put it in a picture for you, um, I, I'm, I'm sure in a room this large, um, and, and I know over the course of the past five, six years of our church, I've, I've known people who've, who've had free rides to college with an asterisk. So not just like, here's money, you go do whatever, whatever you want to do. It's, here's, you go study this program, we'll pay your way. But there's an asterisk. So the military does this all the time, right? Well, you, then you come back and you work for us. And in some very real practical ways, they own you. The organization owns you as a result of you paying back that debt by working for them. This is the closest thing to in, in this room that we might have to this. But the idea here is they're, they're, they are bond servants. They are people who are working off debts. And he's speaking to it, the, the lowest class of the society in, within their churches at the time. It says, you who are bond servants, you who have employers, this is how you were to respond. And I don't know about you, but I have had some terrible work experiences. Have you had terrible work experiences? Mondays are super hard around here. Um, Pastor Adam is just grumpy. It's, just, it's terrible. Um, uh, before I went to ministry, um, uh, we... Uh, I, some of you know my story, a little bit of my story. I worked for the largest home builder in the region I was in. And, um, and it was a really, really interesting experience. Um, I, I had quite a few run-ins um, with people, and they were, oddly enough, they were all women. Um, and uh, um, I guess I just was, was a, was a uh, skeezy kind of guy that they didn't like or something. But, but in, um, in my interview, my boss actually, in my direct report, actually basically cussed me out in my interview for the job and told me that, uh, no, it was my orientation, that's right, it wasn't my interview, it was my orientation, and basically cussed me out, and that told me basically that she would bury me if I ever missed a closing. I was in charge of all the closings for this home builder, and um, that's a little stressful when you walk in, and you've got like 60 to 75 closings a month happening, and you're responsible for all of them. That's multiple ones a day, and you're going, you're just making, and she's like, if we ever miss one because of you, I will end you, and with a lot of epithets, you know, like in like, you know, very curse words, and, and she was a small, um, she was a small lady, um, and she, and, uh, but she was very boisterous, and, and it was like that every day when I'd go to work, and, um, and then I had, a, I had the HR lady who was in the office next to mine, who was me as a snake, and hated me for some reason, I don't know, it's very hard when you have an HR person who hates you and life, like, it's just really not a good combination when they're controlling all your benefits, you know what I'm saying, and so like, could I have today, tomorrow off? No, no, you may not ever have a day off. And, some, um, and then the, the one who sat next to me in the cubicle next to me, um, she was uh, very gossipy. And when she found out that, that my, my then girlfriend, and actually I got engaged during this time, uh, and now I married said woman, Jana, and, um, and we, we were spending time together, and she was like, and she was talking about spending the night with her and all kinds of stuff. I'm like, uh, first of all, none of your business. Second of all, like, I love Jesus, and so I'm not doing that. And, um, and so she's, and, and then all of a sudden, it was every day, it was either like, you think you're better than us, don't you? Or, if that wasn't it, it was like, no, you really should. That's a mark of maturity to kind of progress to that level in your relationship. I'm like, no, it's a mark of maturity to follow Jesus and do what he says to do. And so, like, we would have these arguments every day. And, like, so all these people who were directly around me, I found myself in the midst of it. I would get there early to work, to get my work done before my cubicle partner came in and started talking to me so I could actually get work done. Um, I, it was just an interesting time. And about two weeks in, I was like, Lord, seriously? And God was like, yes, seriously. <laughs> and um, and um, I'll never forget, I had, I was like, all right, I'm just going to do what you said to do. And some of this was ringing in my ear, specifically this passage. Not only to the good, de good and gentle masters, but also to the unjust are we to subject ourselves. For this is a gracious thing. When mindful of God, one endures sorrows while suffering unjustly. For what credit is it if when you sin and are beaten for it, in other words, if you do things incorrectly, if you do not, if you sin, if you're out for selfish gain in those positions, what, what good is it, what credit is it if you actually get punished for it? Rather, if you do good and suffer, then that is a very gracious thing in the sight of God. That's hard things to hear when you don't want to go to work every day. That's a hard, hard thing to hear. Let me be clear about something. Uh, scripture in nowhere, nowhere 
endorses enduring cruelty and harshness from fear or cowardice. It never commends that. If you simply allow stuff to happen to you because you're afraid to do something else, Scripture doesn't, doesn't elevate that or commend that at all. Rather, Peter here is commending those who endure who endure and stay the course and the calling that God has for them even in the face of opposition. This is what Peter is commending. So if we submit because we are trying to honor Christ in this kind of submission, even in times of cruelty or harshness, is commendable. Uh, you know, my job was interesting when it kind of worked its way out. Um, my, my office mate, she got fired um, uh, for just, uh, just I, I didn't pray for that, it just kind of happened. And, um, <laughs> And it made every day easier. And, um, and, but still praying, my, my HR lady, she got cancer. Really, really aggressive cancer. Terribly afraid. Got to pray with her in her office. Got to stand there and pray and ask God to heal her. Got to see that cancer go into remission while I was there. It was awesome. She, her whole life changed in a matter of course of about six months. The lady across the hall, I didn't even mention, started asking me on a regular basis to pray for her son. She was so scared for what was going to happen to him. He's kind of going off the rails. He's got to pray with him, her and him. He's got to see her kind of start going back to church. My boss had this crazy, she was, a, she was intense. She'd come to work every day, and she started getting sick. And we're like looking at her like, you were obviously sick. Like, and, and like, you don't look well. You need to go home. And she would come to work because she was such a workaholic. And it turned out her appendix had burst, and she lasted for like, I don't know, over a week coming to work, even with this, and that's insane, it's a miracle she's, and she, that she was alive, finally got it diagnosed, got it taken care of, and she was out for like six weeks, and they basically functionally gave me her job while she was gone, so I'm doing this vice president's job, and my job as a recent college graduate, way over my head, working way too many hours, didn't get paid a dime for all of my overtime, and my boss came back, she was a different woman, got to pray with her. Got to really serve her and love her. Never got paid a dime extra for all the extra work I did. And then when I'm leaving the work, my boss, my, the president of the company, comes down to me, and he's a, and he's a Jewish man, and he said, um, hey, yeah, I know you, you're going to go into ministry. Have you ever thought of being a rabbi? And um, <laughs> I was like, honest to God, I was like, I, I don't think it works like that. Like, like, <laughs> like, like okay, well, I don't know. We'll figure it out. But... What am I saying? I'm not trying to be like, hey, I'm awesome and I changed the, the corporate uh, the culture of a company. Uh, they went through some challenges after I left and it wasn't because I left. I mean, um, and there were people there who loved God who weren't just me. I wasn't the only one. But in my sphere of influence, um, what many people would term, of, of the, would term abuse happened to me. Um, and and I, I could go on, but it, it was pretty rough. But... I was able to see God tangibly redeem my time in that place. My bank account didn't get fatter. They never gave me a bonus. Nothing like that ever happened. But you know what? There are lives that were forever changed as a result of a little bit of faithfulness. I'm so thankful I stayed the course. I'm so thankful I stayed the course. Because I got to experience God's grace that I wouldn't have otherwise if I'd retaliated improperly or if I'd have just left. Now, that was my calling. I am not advocating staying in abusive situations. I'm saying, obey Jesus. Obey God. And when you do, and you find yourselves in those situations, those kind of situations that are tough and hard, and you're going through things, do not simply assume that God's providence is not for you to be there. Sometimes it is. And when it is, we are to respond well. We are to submit to the authority around us, and then... We're to take responsibility and to do good with all that is before us as we work out this life. So, as recipients of God's grace, we're to bravely take responsibility and submit to earthly authority. That's the big idea. But why should we actually do this? Peter makes it super clear to us, and he starts in verse 21. For to this you have been called. This is your calling. This, to put it in other ways, this is your job. This is your vocation. Because Christ also suffered for you, leaving you an example so that you might follow in his steps. Peter knows exactly how difficult it is to follow Jesus. He left a good job. He was the oldest of the disciples, it's assumed, because he's the only one who had to pay taxes with Jesus. 
It's assumed that that he he was definitely a go-getter and would get stuff done, and yet he lays it all down and follows God wherever, or Jesus wherever he leads. And so I think what he's saying here in this moment is he's like, listen, I've got, I know this is hard, and I know this doesn't make sense, but I've got, I've got a great example for you to imitate. I've got the perfect exile for you to follow, and it's the one who flung the stars into space. This one will lead you. We're to imitate the one who Peter says this in verse 22, who committed no sin, neither was deceit found in his mouth. When he was reviled, he did not revile in return. When he suffered, he did not threaten, but continued entrusting himself to him who judges justly. He himself bore our sins in his body on the tree that we might die to sin and live to righteousness. By his wounds you have been healed, for you were straying like sheep, but have now returned to the shepherd and overseer of your souls. That language should do something in us. It should call us back a little bit. John 10, Jesus, he's talking about Jesus. If you didn't catch up by that point, John 10, he says, Jesus speaks and says, I am the good shepherd. I know my own and my own know me just as the Father knows me and I know the Father and I lay down my life for his sheep. I'm the shepherd. I'm the one leading in this to jog your memories. I say this a lot because Psalm 23 is so huge in my life because he says this, the Lord is my shepherd. I shall not want. He makes me lie down in green pastures. He leads me beside the still waters. He restores my soul. He leads me in paths of righteousness for his name's sake. We love that part. But then he goes on to say in, in, in the Psalms, Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil. Even though I'm walking through these places, as Christ is still leading me, I will fear no evil. For you are with me, your rod and your staff, they comfort me. God is with us in these moments. And he's prescribed for us through the Apostle Peter's writing how we are to respond. So we have the opportunity before us to imitate him to a world that desperately needs to see him because they've never seen it before. How do you disagree with someone and still honor them? How do you do it? Well, God did it in you. He sure hated a lot about your life. And yet he sent his son to give the most precious thing he ever could for you, namely his very blood. Jesus is our example. We can go on and on and on about the ways that this works out practically, but the reality for all of us is is that we have opportunities in the midst of suffering and disagreement and even chaos and wondering where in the world our nation is headed Who's going to take the reins and, and, and all that kind of stuff? We have, our, we have the opportunity to place our hope in God, the one who, like Jesus submitted to, judges justly, who will meet out perfect justice in the end, and then we can respond correctly now to one another and to the authorities over us. You know, my son, I, going back to my son, do you know why I tell him not to hit his sister? It's not because she didn't deserve it. That is not it at all. I am preparing him for the future that he is to walk into. My son is going to be, by God's grace, a man of God. My role as his dad and my wife's role as his mother is to help define him now. This is our role as parents. We define our kids the world doesn't define our kids. They don't define themselves at this age. We define them. We, bring, we set them on a trajectory of, for which they can trust God and, and, and perfectly unpack who they're created to be as God leads them. But for now, I'm helping him. And I'm helping him to see that as a man of God, you are called to, to protect the people and care for people and serve the people who are around you, which means you do not hurt them intentionally. You do not hurt the women around you intentionally, I tell him. Why? Because one day he needs to know that his job, and he needs to own the fact that his job is to protect, to serve, and to lay his life down for those he is called to take care of, which will include his wife and his kids and his sisters and his mom, should something happen to me. That's one of his primary roles, or that's a, that's a core role for him in his future. But that protection isn't just from the outside world. He's to protect them even from himself. He's to protect them from himself and his own selfish desires and his own wants and his own desires even to retaliate. This is what God is saying to us in some ways. There's a measure of his grace he's wanting to pour out to the world through you that you just just cut off when you refuse to submit or act in the ways that he calls us to. I hope you see this this morning. You see, we have the opportunity to be exalted with Christ. 
one day perfectly we get to be exalted with Christ. We have the opportunity now to live in the righteousness that he provides through his death. Our wounds can, in fact, be healed. In him we can entrust ourselves um, um, to the one who judges justly. In other words, we can have patience and trust that God will mete out justice perfectly, even though we will never experience, experience it perfectly this side of heaven. And in him we also have the strength available to us to walk out in this world what God would have us do. Because he is our shepherd. He is the guardian of their souls. He is leading us. He will give us all that we need to respond correctly in these times. And so because of what Jesus has done as our great example, you absolutely can face today. You can respond honorably and well to human institutions. And you can walk into your dreaded work situations or relational situations and even there respond without sinning and experiencing God's grace both person, personally and giving that in those situations as well. It's only possible through the power of Jesus that he extended or gives to us. It's only possible when we submit and we repent and we turn our back from all those things, all those lesser loves of pride, of self-pity, of being right, of personal justification and the sense of justifying ourselves. When we, when we turn our backs on all that and we trust him, be the one to complete that. That is, a po- that is a possibility. And our world, our nation, our workplace, our relationships will look like a vastly, vastly better place. Would you pray with me?